Welcome back to the lab. On today's menu is this nice Burroughs self-scan display. This one's diff quite a bit different than the previous ones I've done. This is 8 lines by 32. And this one is pretty spectacular. The characters are bigger, but this thing has about 100 TTL chips driving it. So I'll show some demos here and then we'll get right into it and see what makes it tick. Interestingly, I actually have the application note for this very product here. This is a pretty rare. This usually never happens. It explains how it works, how to use it, all that good fun stuff. Look, there's the three circuit boards in there, the size of it. A little block diagram. Theory of operation character set and then how to actually use it timing diagrams everything you need to know to make this display work it's all right in here interestingly this pinout actually is not quite right for this display this pinout is for some other kind of connector so I actually had to figure out the pinout of that connector myself which was not very difficult Another little diagram there, how it works. So that made life really easy. Using this display is fairly easy as well. There's only six data lines this time. So that means there's only 64 possible characters. There's no lower case, of course. It's all uppercase. No special characters or anything like that. Pulling the, pulling the camera way back here, we can kind of see what it takes to run this thing. This display needs a lot of different voltages. It needs 5 volts, and we're getting about 1.7 amps on our 5 volts. It needs negative 12 volts, it needs positive 30 volts, and it needs negative 250 volts. Because this power supply only goes up to 20 volts, I'm using this little baby power supply here to output 18 volts and then I'm using this to output 12 so that gives me the 30 volts. Then for the negative 250 volts I'm using this little power brick that was seen in the previous video so that works quite well. You put 12 volts in you get 250 volts out so easy as that. And Then this is my pick board here and this has a pick on it and this is taking the serial from the computer so whatever I type on the keyboard it goes on the display. Then I just got the wires hooked in here nothing really very complicated. I basically hooked up the six data lines, the right signal, the done signal, and home signal, and that's all I have on here. There's no other signals. There's like a whole bunch of other signals, and I just really don't need them, so I didn't hook them up. So the data sheet says this thing takes 35 watts, so we got 1.7 amps at 5.2 volts. 12 volts at 34 mils. That supply in the that plus this is giving me that 30 volts. And then we're getting 1.4 amps at 12. This is supplying the negative 12 and it's also running this little power brick so almost all of that power is generating that 250 volts. Get a little, a little closer here on, the, on my lash up. It's kind of hard to see. There's a cable back here coming out with these little plugs on it so I've got my wires plugged into or clipped into there. And since this has a 50-pin Centronic style connector on it, I've actually soldered wires to the circuit boards that are in this card cage and brought them out, so that makes life a lot easier. I would have used a connector, but I don't actually have one of those connectors. There's a nice close-up of it running. In the manual here, there's a little message on the display right there, so I thought it'd be pretty funny to make this display say that same message. So there's the message that is on the data sheet here. I notice there's right here, there's this one column that's not working right, and there's nothing I can do about that. It's inside the glass. I think 
This display has been repaired. A couple of the chips have actually been replaced. So I suspect the scanning stopped on this particular column and that's what damaged it. So it's like sputtered, so I don't think there's any way to fix it. Maybe if I let this run for a while, it'll actually fix it, so I don't know. If I put like D's on the screen, you can actually see that quite well. The letter D has all the pixels on in this particular column, so it would highlight that problem the worst. Here's a pretty good picture of what the pixels look like. You can see the little tiny points of light for the pixels that aren't on. And then the pixels that are on have a bright dot. And then there's a very fine line going across the top of those pixels. And that very fine line is the secret to how this works. What they do is there is a scanning glow on the back side of the display. And you can actually see it through those really little tiny holes. And then for a pixel to be on, the wires on the top are energized and that pulls the glow through that little tiny hole and makes the top side illuminate where you can actually see it. Yeah, the display is extremely orange, you would say neon orange actually. But for being as old as it is, it seems to work pretty well. It appears to have been made in 1973. If I get the camera really close, you can probably hear the buzzing sound. That's actually this display panel making noise due to the capacitive nature of the electrodes in there. When the scanning glow goes from left to right, it causes the electrodes to move very, very slightly, and then that you can hear that as a buzz. I don't know why, but for some reason, when the display is first turned on, it goes into this really weird mode like this. But if you clear, if you, if you, uh, clear the display, then it fixes it like that. Now it's, now it's working. Cursor's there and everything. I can type whatever I want on there. So now I've removed that little metal surround. You can kind of see some of the gubbins. Down here it's glowing fairly brightly orange and that is actually that scanning glow. Unfortunately I cannot take the glass out of this frame to actually show what that glow looks like. It's extremely bright. A lot brighter than you would think. These little fine wires right here are actually the scanning electrodes. There's one for each column. And what they've actually done is on the other side of the display, someone has painstakingly manually soldered them into seven groups. Up in here, it's really hard to see. Underneath the RTV, someone actually has soldered those pins together into seven groups to form the scanning groups and it scans from left to right by sequencing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven over and over again. You can actually up here see some burn in on the display that was there obviously when I got it. It doesn't seem to really affect operation but it is there. These little fine wires right here you can see them those go across the display and when these wires are activated that's actually what causes that pixel to light up then they come down here and they're terminated on this connection over here. There's one for each active row. So in between the rows there are no wires because there's no pixels there. And this is the this is the cover that was over the top. It just sits on there. There's these little cutouts that these screws go on. So if you get one of these displays, never ever pick it up by this frame. Because if those screws are loose, this frame will come off and then you'll drop the whole display. It just sits on the top here. So I always handle it by the back or the sides, never by this, this frame and filter. I like that little warning right there about needing air circulation must be provided if it's mounted in anything other than vertical. Here's the display by itself. This is where the power goes and interestingly enough the voltages are actually marked on these little tags which was nice of them. This little quarter inch quick connects. Data comes in here on this 50 pin like printer port slash Centronic style connector there. I find it highly interesting that some poor sucker had to hand wire wrap all of these connections. They probably hand soldered this connector too. So these wires go to these connectors and that's not all, there is another wire wrap connector here which connects to the display driver board right here. So there's a no less than four circuit boards on this. Let's start taking the boards out here.
the boards are out. You can kind of see some of that driver board. I'll I'll show a picture here of what it actually looks like. I had this apart when I got it and cleaned everything. Here's what the driver board looks like. This is what the dis back of that display looks like. The display is glued into the metal frame, so it's not really removable. So this is as good as I can get. There's inside the cage, nothing left. Just some connectors, and then the bottom board. This is the bottom board. It's got a four megahertz crystal right here, which does all the timing. And this board is like the XY timing control. It has all the counters. This generates the cursor and a few other things. This does basically all the timing is generated and, and controlled on this board. All the control signals pass to this one board. Back side's not terribly interesting. Here's the next board. This is the graphics board. This is the character ROM. This holds the 64 character font. It's an MK2301. Nothing really special there. Those six liners had this exact chip on them and the one lines have that exact chip also. And the rest of these chips are basically a whole lot of flip-flops. These actually latch every row of each character. So there are eight sets of latches and these latch one column of each of eight characters. And then they're fed in parallel to that display board where they're driven onto those really small wires I showed earlier. So this is what actually connects to those wires through some drivers. Again, the backside isn't terribly interesting. So this is the memory board and it has some addressing logic. And it has these six chips and these are 256 by one shift register chips. And what they do is they actually store the six bits of ASCII one bit per chip. And there's exactly one location for every character on the display. What they do is they loop through this memory one at a time. And as the memory goes by, they display the character. And since the display is scanned top to bottom, left to right, this will store eight characters for one whole column of characters, and then the next eight, and the next eight, and so on. Then once it gets to the end, the data that comes out of the end of this shift register is literally fed back around and goes right back into the input side. When this displays the data, that looping around is how it maintains the memory. So when you update a character, it actually has to wait for that data to come around and then it will replace it right before it gets shifted back in. So you have to wait a little while to actually write data into this display. Again, the back side isn't terribly interesting on this. A shot of all three boards together, side by side. So there's about 96 chips, I think it is all told. Most of them are TTL chips. Most of them also have a proprietary Burroughs eight digit part number on them. But thanks to the wonders of modern technology, I have a little chip identifier. So I just pop the chip off the board, plug it in, and it tells me what TTL chip that is. Finally, I got this really cool Burroughs folder with information on some of their products in it. I believe I got this when I bought one of these displays off of eBay. It looks very, very 70s. Nothing on the back, really. Inside was this application note on that display that I just showed off, which I went through earlier the sales companies who sells Burroughs stuff in the US. And then there's their cell sheet for that same display. You can see the card cage in the back with all those boards in it, then the display part itself, and then here's one where it's put together. This one's a little different than the one I have, but this is exactly what I got. Back in the 70s, this was really hot stuff. If you wanted to have any kind of an electronic display, you were pretty much limited to a CRT or, say, Nixie tubes. And if you wanted more than just a couple digits, you were kind of stuck. It was either CRT or nothing. And so that's what this product was designed for. It was kind of that in-between zone between a CRT and, like, Nixie tubes. And there's that message again. Oh, yeah, and there's another cell sheet for that showing the three circuit boards not in the cage interestingly enough finally i like their this is pretty nice this is actually the theory of operation on how these displays work and i really like their little graphic showing like a enlarged view of what the display looks like and again that's extremely 70s right there 
it has a nice little nice little write-up of how the display is built inside and how it functions and some examples of some of their products like this one and in the future video I will be showing this off and this off I have several of these and by the next Burroughs video I do will be about these very two displays look at all the interesting things you can use this for like a avionics package or some kind of terminal with a very very small line of graphics and I don't even know what that thing is and that's pretty amusing that's like a police officer in a car with a little 8 line by 32 character data terminal he's typing on that has just a little graphic of their panel and then a little Nixie tube as always thanks for watching please comment and subscribe it really helps